like how wine continues to evolve. Like if I opened a bottle of wine today, it would taste different than if I'd opened it on any other day. Because a bottle of wine is actually alive. And it's constantly evolving and gaining complexity. That is until it peaks. Like you're 61. And then it begins its steady, inevitable decline. Mm. And it tastes so good. If it's that good, it's got to be good for your heart, right? That's what we're going to find out. Hi, I'm cardiologist Dr. Rossi with Kramersinger, and welcome to this week's episode of Ask Dr. Rossi. Last week, one of my good friends, Nishima, asked me to do a short video on wine, and I thought that was a great idea because as much as we love wine, interestingly enough, the relationship between wine and heart disease is about as complicated as the relationship between some celebrity couples. So without getting too bogged down in a lot of clinical trials and boring biochemistry that you probably won't understand and probably won't even care about, let me try to give you a layperson's version of how confusing this topic really is. I'm going to illustrate this point by telling you two short stories of how wine got entangled with heart disease. Hopefully along the way, you'll understand how little we really do know and how most of what you read in the media is just a load of sensationalist garbage. And at the end, I'll tell you my personal take and my advice to my patients about wine when it comes to their heart health. My first story begins in 1975 when red wine started its love affair with heart disease. The good folks in Copenhagen, Denmark, did this massive clinical trial which they creatively named Ostabronda Soje. Wow, this is harder than my own last name. Ostabronda Soje. Ostabronda Sojelsen, or the Copenhagen City Heart Study. This was a big clinical trial where 20,000 people in Denmark were questioned about their lifestyle choices and behaviors, and these people were then followed along for 12 years to see which behaviors were linked to heart disease. So a lot of the factors that cause heart disease, like smoking, lack of exercise, or stress, that in hindsight look pretty obvious to us, were established first in this clinical trial. And one of the things it also found was that drinking wine was associated with a 30% reduction in heart disease. Well, that's it, right? Case closed? Well, before you pull out your wine glasses and reach for that bottle of Cabernet, you should understand two little caveats that nobody talks about. First, saying wine consumption was associated with a reduction in heart disease is not the same thing as saying wine drinking caused a reduction in heart disease. Take this example. Here is a graph showing the consumption of margarine in the United States year over year. Here is another graph showing the divorce rate in the United States over those same years. Now, statistically speaking, these graphs show that margarine consumption is associated with divorce. But if I were to say that eating margarine caused divorce in the United States, you'd say that I was downright crazy, and you'd be correct. The lesson here, my friends, is that correlation and causation are not the same. Number two, one more thing that is scarcely discussed about this trial is that while wine drinkers had a 30% risk reduction in heart disease, it turns out that beer drinkers also had a 22% risk reduction. So it looks like although wine drinking is good, it's not all that better. So what does this story tell us? Well, first of all, it tells us that maybe there are two things in wine that help the heart the alcohol, and number two, another chemical. The alcohol may be the reason why wine and beer both had benefits in reducing heart disease. If you think about this, this makes perfect sense since alcohol is a socializing agent, it relaxes us, gets rid of stress, and we already know that stress is a major contributor to heart disease. 
There's also clear evidence that alcohol can marginally increase your body's good cholesterol or HDL cholesterol by about 10%. So that might be a contributor as well. The second point from this study is that it also suggests that there may be something special in the wine, like antioxidants, polyphenols, flavonoids, isoflavonoids, and so forth, that might confer additional benefit to wine drinkers and explain why wine is still incrementally better. So is there some chemical in wine that is responsible for these additional benefits? And that brings us to story number two. This story is about a biologist named David Sinclair. Yep, this guy right here, who, while researching the genes that control long life and longevity, stumbled upon a chemical compound called resveratrol. When given to animals, had some pretty remarkable benefits. Resveratrol turned on the genes that reduced heart disease, reduced the incidence of diabetes, cancer, and even increased lifespan. At the time, it seemed that Dr. Sinclair may have actually even discovered the fountain of youth. And guess where resveratrol is found in nature? You guessed it, in red wine. And this is where the sensationalism around red wine all started. The discovery of resveratrol literally marked the second coming of red wine. The media started going bananas about resveratrol and the consumption of red wine went through the roof. Supplement manufacturers kickstarted a $30 billion industry selling resveratrol tablets touting every single benefit you can imagine. And as is the case with most things that are too good to be true, so was the case with resveratrol. Here's why. First, resveratrol is found in abundance in red wine, but it's not found in abundance in every type of red wine. Certain red grapes, such as Pinot Noirs, Beaujolais, and Cabernets, have much more resveratrol than your run-of-the-mill Merlot or Zinfandel. And then to make things more interesting, resveratrol is not even exclusive to red wine. A lot of other foods like cranberries, blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, pistachios, chocolate, all have resveratrol. Third, by my calculation to get enough resveratrol to have the same beneficial effects that Dr. Sinclair saw in his mice, you need to drink the equivalent of about a thousand bottles of red wine every day. That is one sure way to get one heck of a hangover. And lastly, what about resveratrol supplements? Well, initial human studies have been a horrible disappointment. And resveratrol supplementation, as it turns out, doesn't work in humans the same way it was shown to work in mice. So what's the verdict on wine? Well, there's clearly something that points to a link between modest consumption of wine, that's about one to two glasses per day, and cardiac health. But the God's honest truth is that nobody has the faintest clue whether it is the alcohol, the resveratrol, some other compound, or a combination of all of them that confers this benefit. And as I mentioned before, since association is not causation, we're still not even sure whether a glass of red wine really does help your heart. That's why every claim you see on red wine, whether on TV or in the news, always says red wine may give you this benefit and that, just like subscribing to my channel may make you infinitely smarter and healthier. Satisfaction not guaranteed. To make matters worse, what we do know for sure is that any type of alcohol in large quantities is definitely harmful to your heart and liver. People can develop coronary artery disease, heart failure, stroke, and even dangerous arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation in a dose-dependent fashion with increased alcohol consumption. And don't even get me started on the damage it can cause your liver. So what do I recommend to my patients? If you enjoy drinking wine and are already consuming it, limit your consumption to no more than a glass of wine a day. Honestly, with what we do know now, it doesn't seem to matter whether it's red or white. Drink whatever you like. If you don't drink alcohol, don't be deluded into thinking that starting to drink wine is a smart idea to protect your heart. It simply isn't. The data isn't there, and the available data is so sketchy and circumstantial that the downside risk of alcohol overconsumption greatly outweighs any potential benefit from acquiring this new habit. It just isn't worth it. So the bottom line is, drink wine to your health, not for your health. 
Sorry, Nashima. I know that's probably not what you wanted to hear. So if you have any questions, please feel free to leave me a comment and I'll do my best to answer them with the latest available scientific knowledge. And as always, if you enjoy watching videos like this, please help the process along by hitting like and subscribe so that you never miss another posted video. That's it from me this week and have a happy and healthy heart.